Good morning. I'm glad you're able to devote some time to worship this week. I do want to announce that uh, the Shelbina Methodist Church will be doing its annual Thanksgiving meal. We will uh, either deliver or you can do a takeout on the day of Thanksgiving from uh, 11 to 1, I believe is the time. And uh, you can call the church. Let us know how many meals you need and where to drop, deliver them, or you can come the day of and, and pick some up, whatever works for you. So, how good does a sermon have to be for you to stop and listen to it when you hear something, when you hear a sermon during the week? I'm not talking about Sunday morning. I'm talking about during the week, if you hear a sermon, TV, radio, or something else. Like, how good does a sermon have to be for you to stop and say, ah, I'm going to listen to this sermon now? However good you just thought of, that's how good of a preacher John Wesley was. John Wesley began the Methodist Church, and the way that it began was with John Wesley preaching, not on Sunday mornings, but out in the fields, on the roads that people would walk to as they were walking home for, from working in the factory. And so, like, if you, you can imagine, people have just worked a full shift in a factory, and there's someone preaching, and it's good enough that they stop after having worked all day to listen to what he has to say. These sermons, which we have, uh, John Wesley took meticulous notes about everything, right? These sermons are the basis for what Methodism believes <clears throat> to this day. If you want to know what Methodism teaches, here, let's read some sermons of John Wesley together. That, that's the bedrock, that's the core uh, of the Methodist church. It is indeed a bit messier than what other churches have as the core of their tradition, but I, I confess I greatly appreciate this, that the, at the center of our church is a, a guy taking the Bible and saying, this is how we live it today. That, that, that discussion, take the Bible, how do we live it today? I, I like that. Now, one aspect of Wesley's sermons were their intense practicality. There are no rhetorical flights of fancy. He's not trying to impress anyone. He's trying to help people follow Jesus with regards to the pressing matters of life. And after leading people and then gathering people to create small groups and then recruiting leaders to lead those small groups and creating this network of small groups gathering weekly to practice follow, follow Jesus faithfully, after doing this for years and hearing the feedback from the people and the leaders and the various groups, Wesley had a very good sense of what the practical needs were. This is why in 1741, he preached a sermon titled, The Use of Money, and he preached it for the first time. It was the first time. He would come back to it 26 more times between 1741 and 1758, right? Why did he do this? Why did he keep, keep on coming back to this is how Christians use money? This is how we use money. This is how we use money. Like, why did he keep on coming back to this topic again and again? Well, that time period, the 18th century, is a time period of immense change. It is the time period in which Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. It's the beginning of this sort of what we would consider economics today as the Industrial Revolution is going through Britain and then it's about to start up over, excuse me, over in America. And as, as that Industrial Revolution happens, it is changing the lives of people. And so think about what it would mean to be a farmer at the beginning of the 18th century, and then how much it changed by the end. Right? As a farmer at the beginning of the 18th century, you get up with the sunrise, you go to bed with the sunset, you live with a, a crop-based economy. You barter, like you can exchange your crop for the other things you need. Right? And so a, that, that's how you live, on your land, in the country, and then the Industrial Revolution starts growing and factories start to, to pop up and more and more people 
are going to the factories. And that's where Wesley is finding people who he's preaching to are then coming and joining small groups and becoming part of the Methodist movement. But think about what a difference that would be. Like, they really struggled. People at, working in the factories really struggled with they're used to getting up when the sun rises and going to bed when the sun sets, but when you're working in a factory, you have to be at work at 8 a.m. That's what the clock says. How many of these people didn't have clocks, right? And now they have to show up at 8 a.m. And instead of being a barter crop economy, now they have something that is brand new. They have a paycheck. Like, that's a new idea. We're going to pay, uh, like, this paycheck from a factory. How different would that be? And, and so Wesley had this front row seat of watching people trying to figure out what to do with money when they had money for the first time in their lives. Like, they, farmers just don't have money. Like, they just have crops. And now they, they've transitioned and they're working in the factory. Now they have money. And what are they going to do with it? And so this is the sermon that results, is, is how do you use money? It's a new question. They need to figure it out. And it is still true today that how to use money continues to be a pressing question. As of uh, November 9th, 2020, like just a few days ago, the Census Bureau did a snap survey uh, of uh, adults across America. And what they found was that one third of adults surveyed had found it difficult, either somewhat or very difficult, to cover their household expenses in the last week. Like right now, one third adults in America having a hard time covering household expenses. Right? And so money is always important, and it's, a never, it's never a low-key topic, but it's always important, and it is always practical, and it is always worth talking about. So the way that Wesley gets into talking about this is he tells the parable of the unjust steward in Luke 16. The story goes as follows. Jesus said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a steward, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. And he called him and said to the steward, what is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. The steward said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking this stewardship away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that people may receive me into their houses when I am put out of the stewardship. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill, sit down, and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? A hundred measures of wheat, he said. His response, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest steward for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous mammon, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal habitations. The children of this age are more shrewd when it comes to these matters." Why is it that the children of, of this age are more shrewd when it comes to matters of money? Let me ask, how often do you hear this is a topic of discussion in the church? How often do you hear a, a open discussion of how to use money in church? And compare that to how often how, how many places can you find advice on how to use money anywhere else? Online, newspapers, groups, right? There's so, there are a lot of places to learn how to use money. The one place that we really don't talk about money much is, thus, is in the church. The, the children of this age are far more shrewd about the use of money than, than the church, the Christians tend to be. So Wesley wants to talk us, to us about how we use money. And as he points out, that starts with making sure we understand who we are in this. 
Right? When, when we look at who we are in relation to God, we can look at ourselves as, as uh, sinners who need to be forgiven, and that's true, but that doesn't help us figure out how to use money. We could look at ourselves as servants seeking to do the will of our master, and that's true, but it doesn't really help us think about money. The term that he points to and that is most helpful is this term steward. Now, steward is um, the term used in this parable. It's a term that has fallen out of use to a degree. The term that is more commonly used today is manager, but I don't think manager has quite the same sense to it. Manager, you show up, you manage, you leave. There's kind of that sense of you show up, you do your job, you're middle of management, and then you go home. That's not quite what a steward is. A steward is someone who has been entrusted with something. Right? The last time I heard this term used in sort of common... Uh, themes, common movies, whatever, would be in the Lord of the Rings, the steward of the, of the kingdom of Gondor. The steward is the guy who rules the kingdom in lieu of the king, doing what the king would have done if the king was there. And um, that's the sense of a steward. You are, to be a steward is to, to be entrusted with something that is not yours, that you will then use and you will return having done with it what the owner would have done with it. To give you a, an example of this, right, this is my fountain pen. If I loan this to you until next Sunday, that's a loan, and, and you are, that we, that, that's not stewardship. If I hand you this pen, though, and I say, I'm going to give you this pen, and this week I want you to use this pen to write the sermon that I would have written, that's stewardship. Right? That is, Tate, you are being entrusted with something to use it like, the per like you were the person, according to the desires and the wishes of the person who owns it, right? the person that is entrusting you with something. And so what we are stewards of is uh, what God has given us. We, we need to be able to give an accounting when we stand before the owner, God, uh, as the parable lays out. When we give an account, we need to be able to give an accounting of what we have used, what we have done with what we have been entrusted with. And what we have been entrusted with are things like our souls, our souls such that we can cherish what is good, what is right, and what is honorable to focus ourselves on, on what the beautiful things as God would. To, we have been entrusted with our bodies to use them, to speak graciously, to build patiently, to serve willingly towards God's kingdom. We have been entrusted with skills and talents that we are entrusted with them so that we might refine them and, and use them as tools as we seek to speak graciously, build patiently, and serve willingly. Right? And, and finally, we've been entrusted with our stuff. And that's where it gets a little bit more challenging, right? How do we handle our stuff? What does it mean to be good stewards of, of our money, our goods, right? If the children of this age can use money towards their goals, well, we can too. And John Wesley points out that money well used can make a huge difference. Money well used is food for the hungry, clothing for the cold, can create jobs for the people who need them. So Wesley argues that it is incumbent upon us as stewards to use our money well, to be good stewards of it just as much as we need to be good stewards of our souls, our bodies, and our talents. And if we don't talk about what that looks like, it won't happen. And so Wesley gives three rules. Three, because three is easy to remember, and you'll be able to remember these pretty easily. The first rule of stewardship of money is to gain all you can. This might be a bit of a surprise to hear, but this indeed is where it starts. Wesley's advice is to make as much money as you can, assuming that a follower of Jesus would never make money in a way that harmed themselves or harmed another either in the manner of that work or in the product of that work. 
So do whatever job you can. Doing it with diligence, doing it promptly, doing it as well as you can. Make as much money as you can for who else would be, who, who else can we entrust money to? We, 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 would, we need to be able to trust money to people who follow Jesus, that they will be able to use it well. And so make as much money as you can. Second rule. First rule, make all you can. Second rule, save all you can. Wesley is concerned that people will take the money that they are not used to having. Remember, people's first paychecks back in the 18th century. He is concerned that people will take this and use this money to gratify the desires of the flesh to obtain that which draws the eye. <clears throat> And he points out that this risk is more than just momentary gluttony or drunkenness, but it's a kind of respectable way of life that can nevertheless be rather expensive. A way of life that doesn't impair the health, but does cost a lot to maintain. Wesley's advice is to despise delicacy and variety, and instead be content with that which is plain and simple. That we do not gratify the desire of the eye, spending money on finery, needless ornaments, expensive furniture, or gardens that are elegant but don't produce anything to eat. For when we do this, he points out, our we're not satisfied with what we get. We get something, and then we want more. We get something, we want more. Those desires, they grow. And the more that we indulge those desires, the more they grow. And if we go down that path, would it not have been better to throw our money into the sea than to have fed desires in ourselves that will lead us astray? Wesley doesn't make the connection uh, but I think it is definitely there. Uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, um, boys don't grow up, they just get bigger toys. Right? I think that's what we see. How, how many times do, do we get a bigger toy and, and before too long we want an even bigger toy? And we want something that is bigger or smaller, faster or slower, or whatever it is, right? That, that's what Wesley is talking about. Save all you can because if you start spending it on gratifying these desires, the desires are just going to keep on growing. And that this applies to our children and grandchildren. Why would we dare to give them a habit of excess that will lead them to excess? Right? So first rule, make all you can. Second rule, save all you can. And the third rule is to give all you can. This is the essential third rule, the one that is hardest to follow, but without it, the first two just end up causing problems, right? If we make all we can and save all we can, that, that's going to lead to, towards a certain way of life. It is the giving all we can that, that makes our relationship to money healthy. It is the essential third rule that is hard to follow, uh, but we are entrusted as stewards to use this money and to use it wisely. And what is laid out in this sermon on money is first we take care of ourselves, take care of our family, then we take care of the household of faith, and then we take care of all people as much as we, we can. And so this becomes a way of life that Wesley himself embraces. When, when Wesley dies, he does not have any money to his name. Right? He has given it all away throughout his life so that he only ever has on him that which he needs for the coming days. Uh, and this is this third rule, give all you can. This is the rule that he had the hardest time convincing people to follow. It, it's not much of a surprise, and, and it's even less of a surprise uh, uh, today, for we live in a more complex and more challenging time than Wesley did. Wesley could die with no money to his name because it wasn't very expensive to die. It's kind of expensive to die today, right? We don't die at home and then the local people dig a grave and that's that. Now to die usually involves a hospital. And just saying the word hospital costs a thousand dollars. Like, and to have any sort of funeral is going to cost another four-digit sum. Like, 
we live lives now where having money saved up for the future is essential. And so to give all we can becomes a far uh, harder thing to figure out. How much can we give? We have to be able to, to figure out things like, I need one de health care deductible, one insurance de deductible on me in case something happens. And it did when I had my shoulder surgery. I had to be able to pay one full deductible on my health care that year, and that was expensive. We need to be able to pay car payments because cars don't last forever. Be able to put a few bucks aside to retire. Like We live in a more complicated time than Wesley did, did when it comes to uh, our finances, and yet... There, while there are no simple answers, these simple questions are still the ones that are the helpful questions to ask when it comes to how can we be good stewards of our money, of what we've been entrusted with. These questions, which I, I think are fairly easy to remember. Can I make, what, how much can I make? What's the most I can make without hurting others? Right? How much can I save without spending and, and, and drawing myself into the snares of excess of wanting something always bigger, always larger, always faster? And how much can I give in the situation I am in knowing that I have these potential costs, these risks, these things in the future? Right? And these questions, how we answer these questions will change depending upon the family. Some families right now are desperately needing to make more, and some families right now are doing just fine, and they can definitely give more. It's, this is a family-specific set of questions and answers. I do think taking the time to ask these questions is worthwhile, though. Wesley believed it was worth the time so that we might be able to give account of our stewardship so that when we stand before the one who has given us all that we have, that we might know that we have used what we have been entrusted with and used it well, used it for the glory of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, how do we handle all that we have and do so wisely? How do we handle living in a time of complexity, a time of such great divide between those who are doing just fine and those who are struggling to make ends meet? For those who struggle, we pray for situa that their situation might change. For those who have plenty, we pray for generosity. Please bless the asking of these questions, that they might help us make, save, and give, and do so in a way that you find pleasing. Amen. And now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.